This time on Colores. Artist Suzanne Vilme shares how books can be much more than words. The book holds the possibility of just about anything. And I've seen books made about and of unbelievable things. Motion House Artistic Director Kevin Finnan shed some light on how dance can really engage the audience. We're about making things for the eyes and the senses and communicating through them. Photographer Petronella Eitzma hopes her striking images spark conversation and consideration for the victims of Agent Orange. I really believe that a photographer or image maker has a civic responsibility. Lady Fiona Carnarvon's family has lived for more than 300 years at Highclere Castle, the beautiful English estate that provides the inspiration and setting for the television series Downton Abbey. Lady Fiona shares real-life versions of intrigue. Whilst you should never marry for money, it might be foolish to marry without money. It's all ahead on Colores. Suzanne Vilmay creates books as containers for exploration. I'm sure there are other objects that could transform and transport a person. I just happened to find it in the book. I mean, you can remember the books that influenced you. One of my very first books was, I took a great, great paper, poetry book from somebody I didn't even know, and pasted over, that was one of my very first books, where I just pasted over things that I wanted to look at. and. That's kind of where I began making my own books. At the time, I was a graphic designer, so, you know, I was designing books in the trade business. But to make a book from somebody else's book and just paste over was a hugely, it was a great way to begin. There is so much as far as connecting to individual people that a book can do, that it just, it's like water, you know, rising above all of the obstacles of our differences. When the call for entry came out for All Mutanabe Street, it was first for a broadside and then for books. But it was a call for people to respond to the bombing of, a, of, a, of the booksellers in Baghdad. And so, to respond in kind with another book was, I didn't really need to make another book in that way. So when I found the container that could hold maps, and that maps can be filled with anything, and you don't have to read it sequentially. I mean, there are all kinds of, what you think of as rules of the book that I break all the time. I don't really feel like I have to play by the beginning, middle, and end, numbering of pages, filling it with words. Get in the mind of a jet pilot. You're flying over your sight. You're about to drop a bomb. What's below you? And I wanted that to be included with the maps. So it's like, you're not just looking at maps here. You're looking at what you're going to destroy in that way. 
not a political book. I'm not making any political statements. I'm just saying, wow, no. It made me think, like, okay, what would I want on my kneeboard? A book to me is, it's a container. That's why I loved finding the kneeboard. It was like, wow, now here is a container with a very specific intent to can hold something to your body so you can use it while flying a jet. So I love that container aspect of it also. I fear the loss of, of italic, but now I really realize italic is more of a type term and cursive is more the script term. But with that series, I wanted to, I wanted someone to notice what happens in their thinking when they make marks, whether it's a, an Enso with, with a brush and ink, or it's a quill pen, or it's you're taking shorthand, or you're sketching an idea. But that process of moving from what you are thinking and how you put that down, to me, is the most interesting thing. I mean, and I fear that we're going to lose that form of thinking. I did a whole series, I did about 25 books, and they were all called sketchbooks. They were all sewn exactly the same in the sense of a sketchbook. You know, there's a huge resistance to people marking in books. So I have to sort of move them through. When you think about a sketchbook, you think about making marks. So I try to move people into the book by making marks, where I make the marks so that they recognize that this is a space where you can write over the pages. And I probably took apart a dozen books and then reconfigured them into several sketchbooks. Even though I call sketchbooks blank books, they're not blank, they're filled with the possibility of what you will do with your own mark making. I do want to break out of the book. So I don't want to be contained just to that form. And now that I'm making paper, which takes me back as just to the primary source of making paper is like, wow. So there's a huge tradition in the world of artist books, which I think is why I don't think the book's gonna die, I don't think we're gonna lose it, I don't think it's gonna go anywhere, I don't think Amazon or Kindle or any of that is really going to affect because the book holds the possibility of just about anything. And I've seen books made about and of unbelievable things. I felt no boundaries from the very beginning, which I think is really interesting because I watch people and their reaction sometimes to taking apart books and printing over them. That's like almost sacrilegious. To write in a book is another sacrilege, you know. So I've broken down so many of the rules that it just feels more comfortable. Like you don't have to worry. I don't need to reproduce what is being done by others. I really want to keep the book as this place where anybody can come to it and and the more people I can seduce into that form the happier I am. It's a better language than my own voice actually. I can say more in a book and I'm not talking the language I'm talking the feel of my books are. They just are another voice that I that I love using. Motion House communicates abstract ideas through the visual form of contemporary dance. The company was formed in the 1980s and the house scene was happening, there was house dances and there was a, a lot of underground art really resurfacing again, it was a fun time. And we wanted a name that would capture our spirit of bringing everything together under one roof and trying to make something new. Motion, 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 motion. House. 
I suppose one of the key ways that we differ from a lot of dance artists is we always start from a theatrical image. We have imagery that we want to communicate and content and theme. And so we start from our visual world and then we evolve our movement language to go with that for each show. We're a spectacular art. We're about making things for the eyes and the senses and communicating through them. And then it's about welding this visual world that we're drawing on from European theatre and all of the great work that's out there. And then putting that into a very visceral, physical context so that we really push the physicality in our works. Scattered is a show whereby I wanted to make a show about water. And what fascinates me is that in our Western environment, it's on tap, literally. I showed to my kids, I was in the bathroom one day, I turned the tap off, I said, look at this, fantastic. And my kids' eyes rolled up in their heads. I'm like, yeah, it's a turn down. And of course, they don't see the magic of just having water on tap. So therefore, it comes down to that key moment of realizing I am distanced from the reality of what it takes to get fresh water to my house whenever I want it. So I want to make a show where I go, look, I'm going to stop for a minute and go, this is bloody marvellous. This is fantastic. So I make a show about my experience of trying to look at water again. Sometimes some of the imagery is about the beauty of water, it's, it's sensuousness. There's bits about the show that's about the chemical bonding process of H2O and all the rest of it. But it really doesn't matter if you get those things. It's about how you engage with the theme. Because at the end of the show, if you're thinking about water, then the show has served its purpose. We tread a line where we go, and it has its pitfalls and its dangers, where we consider the engagement with the audience and we consider the type of imagery we use and the duration and the editing and the speed and all of that has really been informed from working outdoors. We consider and sometimes we go, you know what, we're going to help them out here, we're going to do this for the audience and then in other parts we're going to go, I really want to challenge them here so I'm going to give them something to give them a bit of confidence in us. We're going to challenge them and then I'm going to bring them back somewhere so they feel that they, they know where they are. There's lots of art now about, you know, altering ourselves surgically or we all think of robots or that sort of thing. Nobody thinks about the person working on the construction site with a machine, digging a trench to within an inch of specification, being able to manipulate over different grounds and move. And the way that that person moves that um, machine is a thing when you have a skilled operator of intense beauty. So we started making these machine dances with machines that I think that in the US are referred to as backhoes, where we would dance with them and on them, we would create movement language for them, the machines would pick us up and pass us between machines, we engage with it. And the machine dance was really a whole exploration of going, look, what is dancing and what is a body? So it had a serious intellectual underpinning to it. Actually, when we made the show, you get huge audiences and you get loads of kids come along. They don't care about what a body is or whatever. They're just having a great time looking at the spectacle of these machines dancing and moving. But for other people, there is the potential for them to read further into it. And I always really liked the two sides. We got one of the largest commissions of the cultural Olympiad was to create a show for the voyage. So in the middle of Birmingham, we created a full-sized ship. We, we built a passenger liner, you know, four stories high, in between the big colonial buildings and the city hall, right in the middle of the city. It was an enormous spectacle on its own. And then we projected onto the ship and onto the buildings around a whole fundamental story of why do people journey? The voyage was very interesting because again, it was like, okay, we're gonna create spectacle, but it's gotta be engaging. Because spectacle has become a dirty word in theater because it's the empty spectacle. It's nothing but its appearance. I think today is the era of spectacle, again, and the way it speaks to us on a direct level. To make something on that scale, which is emotionally engaging, was one of the great moments in my career. Thank you.
it's kind of interesting because you know that you can't top it and then you go oh, well maybe I should stop but actually last year taught me a lot of new things and I want to bring those into the work and touring here and getting the reaction of audiences here to the show that we are touring you go oh that's so interesting that works that was I want to put that in the next show Petronella Eitzma's photography illuminates the multi-generational effects of Agent Orange and Dioxin used during the Vietnam War. My name is Petronella Janneke Eitzma. Uh, in Dutch it would be Petronella Janneke Eitzma. And I'm a St. Paul-based photographer, primarily working in the arts. If there's a common theme in any of my work, it's probably that the base of the external image is rooted in an emotional place for me. So, for example, the installation I had done in 2004 at Augsburg, I titled Trören, which is an old Huguenot word meaning the place in your soul where sorrow moves in and takes up residence. So from that, I photographed 100 people's hands, shooting a hand like a sculpture. The body of work before that really came out of the death of a really good friend of mine who had AIDS. And at the, within a short time period of that, my mother died. I wanted to find something beautiful in that awful time period. And I labeled it Mernon, which is remembrance with great sorrow. That was all botanical images. And all of the flowers or the plants either belong to Jeffrey or my mother. So in that sense, it, that kind of tracks back to if there's a commonality, it's the place where it comes from, not the external look. I've just been standing in the arts for all these years, you know, I just can't not do it. You know, I love working with artists, I love the creativity, you know, everybody's asking questions in their own way and solving problems in their own way and I'm actually working with artists who need work shot for either grant application, exhibition proposals, books, publications. So in my studio I shoot both 2 and 3D work, a lot of paintings, sculptures. So I am going to be asking you kind of like about your time in Vietnam. Okay. I really believe that a photographer or an image maker has a civic responsibility. This work on the legacy, um, my little portrait of an ecocide, uh, work that I've been doing both in Vietnam and with the Minnesota vets, is sort of a metaphorical project for me. On a personal level, I had friends who were affected with cancers and illnesses related to their time in service in Vietnam. Uh, Agent Orange and dioxin exposure. And at the same time, we were yet again ramping up to go to war again in Iraq. And um, I think something snapped for me. I think suddenly nothing made sense anymore. And I kind of gave myself an unpaid leave of absence and went to Vietnam to just do research. So this was 2007. And quickly saw effects on families and, and children. So then I was really fortunate. I was given a state arts board grant to return to Vietnam to actually photograph families in villages and small towns.
the encapsulation of that particular trip and being with those families was that I felt like I was on the inside of a prayer. I can't ever talk about it with, without getting really emotional because it just really doesn't seem fair in life that so many people have to live with something that I feel really culpable for that particular war. And I met so many people who do it with such grace. And these women have to care for these kids. And some of them are now like 39 years old. And some of them are babies, you know? People are still being born affected. I photographed second, third, and beginning fourth generation. I was exposed to Agent Orange, mainly from my job in Vietnam, and also from the uh, excessive spraying around the bases, you know. The nerve is dead on both arms, and that's what's happening to my feet now, and my legs, the exact same thing. The feet are just like... So then the second part of the legacy seems to me the effects on the soldiers, and what's clearest to me is that they have paid for that very deeply. And so of their families and their kids and some of their grandkids and all the rest of the, their lives. Yeah, we've got our penance to pay. I'm trying to understand the cost that they've had to pay and what that's like for them. I, want, I, I do want to understand that. For me, the Vietnam-American War acts as a metaphor for the long-term effects, um, guaranteed effects <laughs> of any war. It feels like it's the project that won't let go of me because it is metaphorical, and because I really do want to understand some truth. I don't know, maybe I'm just kind of looking for a little more level of peace inside of myself. It's not working very well, but, you know. Countess Fiona Carnarvon recalls the generations of her family who have lived in High Clear Castle. My name is Fiona Carnarvon, but I'm also the Countess of Carnarvon, and I live at Highclere Castle, which is better known to many people as Downton Abbey. Highclere Castle has two or three hundred rooms, and it has 50 to 80 bedrooms, and it sits in a thousand acres of parkland, which is completely beautiful, and then a further 5,000 acres of farmland and woodland around that, so it's a wonderful breathing space, and southern England. Lady Almina was an extraordinary woman who in 1895 at the age of 19 came to marry the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, my husband's great-grandfather who lived at Highclere. And whilst he was not exactly impoverished, he nevertheless wanted to marry an heiress because he was a little bit in debt. He um, fixed upon Almina, the illegitimate daughter of Alfred de Rothschild, one of the wealthiest families in Europe at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. She decided she utterly adored him, and he thought he loved her, or might love her. I'm not quite sure at the time. Her dowry was the main thing. It was 500,000 pounds, which is some 30 million pounds today, a phenomenal amount of money. And it was in a wonderful thing called cash. Lord Carnarvon wasn't going to marry without money. He put it like that. There's a line from Jane Austen, which says, whilst you should never marry for money, it might be foolish to marry without money. And I think that was Lord Carnarvon's attitude. <laughs> the staff in Amina's time was much bigger than on Downton Abbey, because there was a house steward, because Highclere was one of the grandest houses, followed by a butler, followed by an under-butler, followed by about 14 footmen, a hall boy, a steward room boy, maids, cooks, still room maids, 25 gardeners. Then there were various departments, a maintenance team, um, um, a wood, woodsman team, because we had our own sawmill there, um, farmers, 
a farming team department. I quite like the scenes which are not shot at Highclere because they're fresh and fun and I haven't seen them being reshot several times over. But I, I think what it is is there's so many different characters, aren't there? There's, you know, whether people are interested in the Bates story or um, the O'Brien and Thomas story or, you know, Cora and Lord Grantham. I always forget whether Hugh Bonnevin and Elizabeth McGovern, I always get the real names and the <laughs> Downton Abbey names muddled up or whether you are following one of the sisters. I think there's many different stories to many different people. But I think my favourite character is the castle. Next time on Colores, social arts practitioner Naomi Natale shares how, as an artist, she has confronted the global issue of genocide. To move forward with this understanding and this respect that if we belong to each other, then we're responsible to one another. And what does that responsibility mean? The Progress of Love is an international exhibit that focuses on the different stages of romance, from infatuation to passion to heartbreak. But this is really heightening the idea that, you know, cultures need rituals um, to perform acts like grief. Technical director for Cirque du Soleil's Arcana, David Churchill, explains the intricacies of preparing the show set. Yeah, I'm sort of like the conduit between crazy and reality, and we try to take the crazy ideas and turn them into reality as much as we can. And... Walt Poirier incorporates his Native American culture into his art, strengthening local community and offering guidance to kids. My philosophy of the art is more on a that cultural side of it, expressive, making an impact. Until next time, thank you for watching. <laughs>